So one of the things that we have to do, and uh, Vanessa will certainly be uh, getting more familiar with this in the, in the coming months, is developing a geochronology or some chronological order to these sediment cores that we collect. And there's mainly two methods that we uh, rely on for uh, developing uh, some chronological order. Uh, the first one is carbon-14, and so this is for the older sediments. And so this is stuff that is potentially uh, 500 years to thousands of years old. And so we may find a spruce needle or a pine needle in the sediment at depth. And then we can send that away and get that radiocarbon data. The other uh, technique that we rely on is lead-210 uh, and cesium. Both of these, well, all of these are radioactive isotopes, and so they decay at a known rate. So carbon-14 decays at a rate of about 5,734 years. Uh, lead-210 is about 22.2 years. So it decays much more rapidly than carbon-14, so we can only use lead-210 for about the last 150 years. Uh, the other thing that we also rely on is cesium. Uh, and so the atomic bomb detonations that were done back in the 1960s, the above ground uh, detonations that were done, put cesium up into the atmosphere. And then that cesium is then dispersed throughout the world and we can use that as a marker for dating. So it wasn't all bad, I guess, at least from a paleo perspective, <laughs> we can make use of it. Um, and so we do have records of that. Uh, and as well, uh, the Chernobyl uh, accident as well, in some cores you can find another cesium peak associated with Chernobyl. Uh, and so these radioactive isotopes provide this kind of chronology for us. And this just kind of illustrates how carbon-14 gets incorporated into every living thing. Uh, and so all of us are incorporating carbon-14. Eventually, we can become part of a study uh, hundreds of years from now, and people can dig us up and, and date when we lived and, and uh, when we ultimately died. Because when we die, that carbon replenishment stops, and really the carbon clock gets started at that point. And so, at death, uh, there's no more carbon uptake or no more carbon-14 uptake, and the carbon-14 starts to decay. And so we know that decay rate, and so then we can figure out, well, how long has it been since that particular organism was living? The other thing that we've uh, been relatively successful with, particularly in, uh, in the Nelson and Cranbrook area, is using tephras. And so these are volcanic ash layers that get deposited uh, in, the, uh, in the sediments. And so the, you may have heard of Mazama uh, uh, from Mount St. Helens. And so the Mazama eruption was about 7,000 years ago. And it deposited a lot of ash uh, across that Cranbrook-Nelson area. We're talking 10, 10 centimeters or so of ash uh, that we find in the, uh, in the sediment cores. And so we can use those uh, very much like a free radiocarbon date. And so it doesn't cost me anything. I'm very happy when I find these things in sediment cores because then I don't have to provide a radiocarbon date, which is three to $600. And so these tephra layers, we can identify which volcanic eruptions they came from, and they give us a date as to when that sediment was deposited um, uh, in, in time. So tephrochronology is another technique that we can use, uh, or that we do use, to date these sediment cores. So now I want to talk about some of the actual results that we've been finding. And so uh, again, this is from uh, Emma's work. And the lake that I'm going to focus on is this lake, Little Trefoil Lake. It's located very close to Jasper Park Lodge. Uh, we're just a stone's throw away to, uh, to the actual uh, to the lodge. Uh, and so the core was collected by Katrina in July of 2007 and really hasn't been had much done to it uh, up until now. Uh, and so Emma has been looking at the, uh, at the charcoal uh, preserved in this lake. So this is Little Trefoil Lake. Uh, it's at an elevation of about 1,000 meters. The depth of it is about 5.2 meters. 
Uh, it's a relatively small lake. Again, most people would probably refer to this as a pond. Uh, I like to call them lakes, though. Uh, and from this lake, we collect, or Katrina collected, five and a half meters of sediment, uh, probably going back seven to 10,000 years uh, in time. So we have quite a bit of sediment to work with. Emma's focusing on about the last three meter, or the top three meters of, uh, of sediment that was deposited, which takes her back to about 2,000 years uh, in the past. The other thing that Emma is doing, uh, we've heard about the, the tree coring. Emma is also collecting uh, tree cores from around her lake, and then in a, in a somewhat systematic uh, uh, sampling plan uh, away from her lake, so she's collected a bunch of trees uh, in the uh, in the past month, and so this is kind of her sampling plan. So Little Trefoil Lake is located here, and what we did was go three kilometers and then six kilometers in the cardinal directions, and then do the same sampling strategy that Vanessa uh, and others on this project have been doing, and collect the tree cores to find out when particular fires have occurred in the past. And then we can use that to try and anchor some of these charcoal records and see if we can identify uh, some of these, uh, some fires from the, uh, from the triggering records, if we can identify those in the lake sediment record as well. So this is what Emma has put together for, uh, this is for the last uh, 1600 years. So she's got this identified a little bit, or labeled a little bit different than probably what you're used to. So 200, this is years ago, you can kind of consider it. So this would be about 1800, 16, 14, 12, 1000 years ago, 1200, 14, 1600 years ago. Uh, and what you're seeing here are, first of all, this uh, kind of high frequency line represents the charcoal that she's actually counted in these records uh, and identified. And so each one of these uh, is, well, where you see these relatively large peaks, these represent what the charcoal program is identifying as a charcoal peak or a fire event at that time. The blue line represents a background charcoal input. And so there's charcoal coming into these lakes, not just from right around the lake, but from extra uh, regional sources as well. And so there's this kind of slowly varying background rate. Some people are now suggesting that you can use that background charcoal level to look at biomass uh, on the landscape and kind of at regional scales as well. And so maybe this is represent or indicating an increasing biomass on the landscape as we go further back in time. Uh, and interestingly, you get to around 1900 or so and this starts to, to uptick a little bit. So maybe there is something there uh, as well with respect to uh, the background charcoal and its representation of, uh, of biomass. So, so far she's identified 44 fire events during the past 1600 years. And this one, we have very coarse dating on the sediment core so far, uh, but 1889 uh, appears to be well represented with the largest peak uh, that we see in the fire record. And it kind of, it really dwarfs all these other peaks that are in the, uh, in the record. So if we remove that, then this gives you a little bit more perspective or a little bit better perspective of what was going on prior to that fire in 1889. Uh, and so again, 44 fire events probably represents a mean fire return interval of about 36 years, which I think is, in surprisingly good agreement with some of the tree ring records uh, that we've been uh, collecting as well. So that's one lake. And so it provides kind of a snapshot around that particular lake. But where this really becomes powerful is where we start to collect several lakes. And so when we start to incorporate Vanessa's work, uh, then we're going from these kind of individual lakes that may have uh, kind of local site factors that are affecting fire around that lake, uh, then we could start to look for patterns in these much larger data, section, uh, data sets. And then ultimately, we may be uh, starting to pick out some really nice patterns on the landscape uh, and identifiable patterns. 
And so that's kind of the work that we were doing down in the, in the Kootenays. And so this is a paper that, uh, again, my PhD student Colin has just published this year, looking at the varying influence of climate and as well aspect as controls on, uh, for, on fire regimes in that region. And in that region, and over a relatively small area, uh, Colin had five sediment uh, core uh, records, uh, uh, charcoal sediment records uh, from that region. And so he was able to get relatively detailed records over a very small spatial scale as well. And so now we can start to examine controls on fire across large spatial and as well temporal uh, scales and look at some of these influences of top-down, so the climatic controls, uh, versus the bottom-up controls on fire. And so looking at different aspects and how that impacts uh, fire, and as well vegetation, changes in vegetation through time, and how that impacts fire. So these are, again, the same types of uh, uh, diagrams, and so Colin's got this going in the other direction this time. So these are the, the top of the cores at this end. And as you move to your left, you're going further back in time. Uh, and so again, these represent fire peaks that are identified. And so these are above that kind of background level of charcoal that's going in. And so we start to get information about mean fire return intervals, uh, ranging anywhere from about 135 years, uh, upwards of 241 years. So we start to get a much better picture and kind of some variability associated with uh, fire in these uh, particular regions. Then we can start to compare these records with one another. And so what this is showing, this is a comparison of some of these lakes that were on north facing aspects versus lakes that are on south facing aspects and how well those records agree with one another as you go back in time. And what we found was they don't agree with one another. And they're actually, uh, they fall into this area of asynchrony uh, for, for a lot of the, uh, of the um, time periods that were examined uh, in this particular analysis. And so when the north-facing slopes would burn, those south-facing slopes wouldn't be burning. And so then we were able to tease out, well, what's going on with respect to climate that may be driving these differences between north-facing and south-facing uh, south aspects. So hopefully that's something that down the line, once we build up a data set in this region, we can start to do those types of analyses uh, as well. Now, the last little bit, I, I just want to talk a little bit about what Katrina is, uh, is thinking about doing for this project. And, and this is kind of my take on it, and so it's certainly not uh, any reflection on Katrina if I say something that's incorrect or, or, or wrong. Um, but what happens to water quality in a lake after uh, a fire? And, and we, we certainly know a little bit about that, or I think we know quite a bit about that uh, with respect to uh, issues of nutrient input and then turbidity uh, as well. Uh, and so after a fire burns through a region and you have these bare slopes, then those slopes can easily be eroded. And all that material can go into the lake and it increases the turbidity in the lake. That has issues for water quality, but it also has issues for uh, the things that are living in those lakes, for the biological entities in those lakes. And as well, we can start to ask questions. Do all fires have similar impacts? Fires a thousand years ago, did they have different impacts than what we see at the current time? Uh, and so we can start to look at those types of questions uh, using these types of techniques. So one of the things that I think Katrina is, is going to investigate is looking at changing nutrient status. And so everybody's probably heard of eutrophication. And so there's nutrient enrichment of, uh, of lake systems normally associated with people, but certainly you can get eutrophication associated uh, with fire events where you can then get phosphorus being released from the soils and then uh, deposited into the lakes uh, and changing those lake ecosystems. So eutrophication is it's synonymous with increased growth of uh, biota, whether we're talking about the plants that line the bottom of the lakes and along the shorelines or the algae that are living within those lakes. And so you can get uh, algal blooms that are associated with these events. And unfortunately, uh, 
the, the key component, orthophosphate, uh, is the, the form of phosphorus that's typically, uh, or that's most vital to uh, the algae that are living within those lakes. But it's very difficult from a paleo perspective to look at orthophosphate, uh, and people have been, people tried this 20, 30 years ago, and met with, uh, with no success whatsoever. So normally these studies are looking at total phosphorus. And so how much phosphorus is going into the lake, and then you can uh, then imply the impact of that on things like diatoms. So the impacts of these types of events and, and the impact of these nutrient loadings that are sometimes associated with fire uh, events, you get increased algal growth uh, and potentially toxins being uh, released into lakes. Uh, taste and odor problems are often associated with these events. Increased plant growth. Uh, shoreline foulings, uh, you can get phosphorus released from the sediments as well, and so this is another issue with, uh, with phosphate that people have to take into account. Um, anoxia at the bottom of lakes because of algal blooms, and so these events can really change the way these systems are functioning uh, as a result of fires. Uh, and in some cases, presence of undesirable species and, and really aesthetic degradation uh, in these lakes as well. Uh, but it depends on the particular lake that you're looking at, uh, whether or not this is uh, a relatively big problem. So there's lots of impacts that result from fire events uh, and then their uh, subsequent uh, impact on these kind of lake systems. So Katrina is going to be doing a lot of work uh, looking at these diatoms. And so these are uh, unicellular algae uh, that live in these lakes. They're made of silica. Uh, and so they preserve very well uh, within the lakes. And, and these things have been used for over 30 years now. Uh, and certainly within the last 20 years, there's been a lot of studies that have incorporated uh, diatoms to look at lake water quality uh, issues. And so Katrina will be incorporating these into, uh, into their study, into her studies. The beauty with diatoms is you have these hundreds or thousands of different species of diatoms, and a lot of them have very different um, responses to their environment. And so this is just hypothetical uh, graphs of six different species. And so in species three here is kind of a generalist, and so here's your environmental variable, so that this could be total phosphorus. And so in species three can live under a variety of conditions associated, or a variety of uh, um, total phosphorus levels. Whereas species one is limited to lakes that have very low total phosphorus. And species six at the other end of this extreme is very high phosphorus levels. And so when you see changes in these diatom communities, and knowing what we know about their kind of modern ecology, then we can use this information to look back in time and see uh, changes in water quality uh, based on the changes in the, uh, in the diatoms themselves. So just to kind of wrap up um, and review, I guess, uh, some of the stuff that I've talked about, records of environmental change a lot of these records that we have are very short duration. Uh, and in the case of fire especially, uh, this overlaps with the period of suppression, which was mentioned uh, earlier this afternoon. And so it's really difficult to develop effective management plans when fire has basically been removed from the landscape. Uh, and so there's long-term perspectives of climate and environmental change are needed to look at these kind of disturbance factors uh, in the periods of time when we don't have those, uh, those impacts. And so by extending these records further back in time, uh, then we can understand the function, the natural function of these systems, and especially with regards to these disturbance regimes. Uh, the paleoecological techniques, so whether it's the diatoms or the, uh, the charcoal records, they can provide this much needed perspective and a lot of knowledge about how these ecosystems have functioned, and as well the dynamics of these ecosystems over long periods of time, and as well over different kind of spatial scales uh, that may be provided with just simply uh, the triggering records. And so combining these records 
we get this nice long perspective. Uh, they can provide information as well about the cascading impacts of disturbances, uh, not only across the terrestrial ecosystems, uh, and so looking at the, the impacts of uh, fire suppression, for example, and changes in these ecosystems in the composition of the forest and as well in the density of the forest, uh, but as well in the aquatic systems. And so when we start to look at fire, what are the impacts uh, of fire on these, uh, on these aquatic systems and how, does these, how do the aquatic systems change as a result of those disturbances? So <coughs> one thing that I, I, I will conclude with this quote uh, which is a really nice quote about using lake sediment cores uh, because you don't have that annually resolved record uh, but still a blunt battle axe is better than no weapon and so even though we can't record uh, what has happened uh, like the tree rings at annual res uh, resolution or even sub-annual resolution we can give that nice long perspective at probably decadal and potentially sub-decadal uh, uh, records as well and so that in itself can provide a lot of information uh, over the, about these ecosystems and about the way these ecosystems function, uh, especially with respect to fire, over relatively long periods of time. <coughs>